So I am so happy to have Jean-Philippe Payment with us today. So Jean-Philippe is the Director of Global Consulting at Myra Geoscience with over 15 years of mineral exploration experience. In 2016, Jean-Philippe pioneered the application of machine learning to the mineral exploration industry in winning the Integra Gold Rush Challenge by application of machine learning to mineral deposit targeting. So he's skilled in the application of machine learning to overcome geological and geophysical challenges by combining geological knowledge and both supervised learning and deep learning. So with his vast experience, it's going to be amazing to hear from him today about opening the deep learning black box to the geosciences with examples in using neural networks in data processing and geological interpretation. So I hope you all enjoy it. It's gonna be an awesome session. And yes, thank you so much, John Philippe, for joining. It's just wonderful having you. Uh, thank you very much, Jessica. I'll uh, just share my screen really quickly here. Yeah, hopefully I won't drown anyone with uh, <laughs> the subject of the talk after these uh, funny bits, but we'll try to keep it as light as possible. Um, it's It could be a very, very sort of uh, difficult subject, but we'll uh, try to sort of get a sense of what deep learning is and how we could apply it to the, to the geoscience world. So that's the whole, uh, the whole goal here. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you all know Mira Geoscience. We're a consulting and software company based out of uh, Montreal, Quebec. We do have offices in Perth and Brisbane uh, for your Australian people. Otherwise, we're uh, present in Vancouver, Montreal, and scattered here and there in, uh, in Canada as well. Uh, so we do a lot of uh, different projects ranging from geological interpretation, geophysical um, interpretation, modeling, inversions, geostat work, machine learning, stratigraphic. We'd like to tailor our projects to every client. So um, every project is sort of different. We don't really have a one solution to all problem. And that's going to, that sort of leads me to the the next slide into the machine learning world, uh, we've applied artificial intelligence at different sources and different things uh, throughout our history. So we do a lot of uh, alteration footprinting and geochemical data set interpretation using um, unsupervised and supervised learning. We'll do uh, automated relogging of core using language processing. So the sort of uniformized uh, drill hole database with lithology. So we use the comment sections to relog the core there. We'll do some deep learning applied uh, to uh, geology and geophysics. That's what I'll be talking today. We do automated wireline interpretation and modeling. So taking wireline geophysics data to create uh, basin models, especially in the coal business. We'll apply it to radiometric data interpretation or prospectivity mapping. Um, prospectivity mapping would be the hardest problem we can solve. Um, I, so I sort of see it as the holy grail of uh, of machine learning applied to the geosciences anyways. Um, so what is deep learning? Uh, it's a sort of subfield of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is sort of the, the, the thing that uh, incorporates all of the different techniques uh, of um, mimicking the human behavior. That's the, I guess that's the end goal uh, of uh, artificial intelligence. Machine learning would be uh, the, the portion where we teach machine to uh, make decisions and deep learning is sort of a subset of that where we use uh, more complicated models to make the predictions. Oops. All right, um, so <laughs> I've got a long description here of what is uh, um, what is machine learning here. Um, so the, the goal of deep learning is to mimic the function of their human brain. It's sort of really coarse, really sort of simplified brain for sure. Uh, but that's what it aims at doing. So the goal is really to sort of uh, follow the decision-making path of a neuron and try to mimic that on the greater scale um, using computers. So there's different um, different approaches, different models that, that can be used. Uh, it performs really well in larger data set of label and unlabeled data, structured or unstructured data. So that's something that's really important about uh, deep learning. And it, it's been theorized for a more than 50 years. It came out in 1950 as a concept. Uh, now it's sort of uh, going through a boom and that's because uh, that computing power and data set are easily accessible right now. So it's easy to, to, uh, to, to implement those model and train them. Whereas 20 years ago, that was almost impossible on the computer. And it all sort of stems from uh, some work that was done uh, out of the University of Toronto uh, with the ImageNet, which is one of the first computer vision algorithm that was put out there. Um, and from there, there's been a yearly contest at improving the scores of the original ImageNet into image recognition. Um, yeah, so why deep learning? Um, so the reason why deep learning sort of comes in, it's 
uh, mostly due to the fact that older or traditional machine learning algorithm uh, seem to plateau in their uh, performance uh, with the amount of data. So that's the graph you see on the right side of the screen here. I'm not sure if you see my mouse or should I change it to a pointer? We can see it, um, but yeah. Oh, you see it? All right, perfect. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so what you see here is sort of a graph of the performance of the algorithm against the amount of data. And you see that traditional algorithm seems to plateau with uh, an increased amount of data, whereas deep learning would uh, sort of keep increasing in performance with the more data you add to it. So that's one of the key things why uh, deep learning is in fact uh, useful. Uh, the other thing, uh, other example from uh, deep learning application comes from the industry. So that's one of the first uh, sort of uh, rollout of deep learning to a uh, economical problem or to an actual real life problem. So Amazon in 2014 were trying to optimize their prime video um, platform. Um, what they were after is getting a better recommendation engine behind the uh, prime video platform. So basically tailoring your suggestion to what you've been watching and what you've watched in the past. And uh, to do that, they collected a whole lot of data. Uh, if you watch any uh, Prime Video, they are watching you more than you actually are watching them. So they know how long you've been watching each show after when you lose attention. If you open any other windows, if you do any other things while you watch it, they, they'll collect all of the information to tailor made their uh, prediction. And that was rolled out in 2014. And when they did that, um, it's it came with a pretty big bump on, in their value. So if you look here, there's a, the inflection in their stock price um, is sort of tied to this. And the reason is because um, from 2013, about 35% of the revenue from uh, for Amazon came from their, um, from their uh, tailored uh, recommendation platform. So that's uh, one of the examples of application. So there is an added value to using uh, machine learning and big data sets. Uh, in, in different industries. Uh, if we look at the geosciences, we're a bit behind on uh, sort of the, uh, the application of uh, deep learning to our data set or even just sort of the research. What I did here uh, came from an article by uh, Thompson and Broadwick uh, in 2021. Um, they went and used AI to sort of understand the presence of AI in the earth sciences realm. Um, so what they did is sort of more linked to the hyperspectral imagery um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the hyperspectral imagery processing part of uh, the earth sciences. Um, but yeah, they looked at all of the publication and that's a, a clustered uh, sort of network graph of the different teams and different words and concepts that were uh, researched um, historically. So you see that uh, machine learning and signal processing are closely, to, are closely uh, tied together. Uh, so that's just from the fact that a lot of the machine learning advancements have been around uh, signal processing. Uh, it's slowly getting towards the earth sciences realm as well, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, if you look at where it's been applied into the papers here and research papers, you see that the earth sciences are slowly getting a little bit more traction towards the application of deep learning. But again, it's been a slow adoption of, this, uh, of these types of uh, of algorithms uh, to the industry. We see more and more papers being published about uh, how to use deep learning in different uh, earth sciences or geosciences scenarios, uh, but the uptake from the industry has been pretty slow. Um, so what are we faced now? Uh, sort of currently the, the state of the mining industry is facing a few new realities that are coming sort of a growing, uh, been growing over the last few years. So one thing is, and you, we've all seen that, uh, that graph here on the top right, but yeah, depth of cover uh, under which we're exploring is getting, is getting more important. Um, so that creates a need for more uh, indirect detection of deposits. Uh, we're trying also to sort of reduce the environmental footprint of exploration work. So uh, we have to do more uh, sort of remote sensing, um, uh, more data acquisition that's on more into the undisturbing realm. So uh, we do a lot of, uh, of work before we actually put uh, boots on the ground so that to uh, narrow down the areas of search and do less uh, ground disturbance. Uh, we're slowly but surely increasing the amount of data we're collecting. Uh, so there's a need for more than just overlying different layers on a GIS with transparency to try to see through the different data sets we have. It, it was one thing when you only had a mag and a geological map. Uh, now you have a lot more geo, um, geological product, geophysical products, uh, data, 
uh, reports that you could read. So there's slowly, we're slowly increasing the amount of data we're collecting uh, with uh, things like uh, the XR, sort of handheld XRF. It's getting easier to get geochem data as well. It's getting cheaper. Uh, hyperspectral imagery of core also produces a lot of data that could be dealt with using um, machine learning. So these things are slowly happening and slowly growing in our world. So I think that comes with uh, somewhat of a need to uh, get more adoption to the deep learning um, algorithms. And we need to optimize the unit cost of discovery. So uh, we need to get more out of the data. So there's there's a lot of data that's already out there that's already public or actually existing throughout the different companies. So there is a need to leverage that data, um, but also to acquire meaningful data that's gonna be used uh, to its fullest potential. So case examples of deep learning in the sciences, um, it's not something new. It's not something that's uh, sort of, uh, um, there to replace any of the practitioners. Uh, if we look in the uh, medical world, uh, computer vision has been used um, more and more and it's sort of getting a really good adoption rate by uh, pathologists to find and map tumors. So that's one example of using computer vision and Im image segmentation to uh, map out the tumors. So basically you have an image from either an MRI, a CAT scan, or a combination of different uh, imagery techniques. And then um, we could use deep learning to sort of uh, map out uh, the tumors into these imagery and create a 3D or 2D, uh, 2D model of the tumors to help the pathologist makes, uh, make his uh, final decision or make his final call and also help the surgeons better plan for their, uh, their uh, surgeries. So again, deep learning is there, machine learning is there, and it's used to augment data or sort of help in the decision making, but at no means it's there to replace the actual doctors or surgeons. Another uh, example of deep learning application in the sciences is natural language processing. And natural language processing has a lot of uh, um, sort of a lot of uh, leeway in, in front of it. There's a lot of empty space in front of it. I think that's something that's uh, bound to grow with time. Uh, that's an example from an article that was published in Nature this year, or last year, actually in 2021, uh, where the authors used a natural language processing technique to extract information out of uh, different papers that, was, that were published on climate change. So here is just an attempt to map what are the consequences of climate change through the different publications around the world. And then you can see basically uh, distribution in the world of where the, um, these uh, different, uh, the different effects of climate change have been mapped to, uh, through the uh, published papers in history. And for us, that's something that I've presented uh, last fall, but the use of natural language processing could really help geologists and sort of better understand or better summarize reports, uh, all of the technical reports that have been published, uh, assessment reports that are sort of lying there on publicly available uh, servers. Uh, so that's something that's probably bound to grow and sort of would help the geologists sort of better uh, make decisions. So today what we'll be talking about is mostly neural networks, uh, which is a subfield of the deep learning. Uh, neural networks, as I said earlier, was sort of uh, uh, thought out uh, in the 1950s. It came from uh, the foundation paper <laughs> named What the Frog's Eyes uh, Tells the Frog's Brain. So uh, two scientists, uh, McCullough at Pitts, looked at a frog brain and uh, the connection between the uh, optical nerve and the brain to see how the neurons uh, sort of actually translated the information from uh, optical stimulus to uh, actual activation of the brain. And that's what you see here. So that, uh, that uh, funky looking uh, sketch here is uh, the neurons. So you have uh, the starting point of the neurons and basically how they transmit information through different layers of, uh, of the frog's brain. And that's basically what the neural net is trying to mimic. So basically we feed in information, there's a bunch of hidden layers and then we get an output at the end. And the output is basically what you're looking for. Uh, so it could be a classification of an image, but it could also be a predictive uh, segment of an image. Also, it could be uh, just a word, it could be anything you want it to be. So there's a lot uh, behind that. Uh, it's pretty uh, flexible in terms of what you're trying to predict. So what a neural net is actually trying to mimic is how a neuron work in uh, the biology world. So if you go back to your old biology class that uh, might be long gone or might be closed depending on how long ago you graduated. But uh, if you remember correctly, that's basically how a neuron would look in your brain. So you have three different portions to a neuron. You have the receptors, uh, the receptor part here, 
with dendrites that extend and connect to other neurons. Uh, you have the propagation axis here, and then you have the transmitter at the end. So basically, uh, information goes into this end and goes out to the other end. And in between, it's transformed into uh, different uh, electrical signals. So basically, it all works at transmitting electricity uh, at different levels. So maybe uh, the electricity input here would be higher, and then be muddled down to the transmitter or the opposite. So that's why we see that uh, neurons are firing. So if you want to represent that into a mathematical and computer version, this is what a neuron would look like. So again, it's the sort of same three main axes, uh, three main uh, portions. So you have the receptor, you have the propagation axis, and then you have the transmitter. Um, so neural nets and neural networks and deep learning are not sort of a black box because you could probably run them on a, I guess, a long piece of paper. So each neuron is a simple calculation that you will do today together. Um, so if you were to build a neural net, uh, you would need to do them a lot of times and then repeat them for every step of, le of learning. That's where uh, it gets really computer expensive. But if you were to just use a single neuron, you could do that on a piece of paper pretty easily. So you have a bunch of entries. In our case, there are going to be numerical entries. So if I have the entries here, so these go through the receptor. So the first operation that goes down is uh, the entries are going to be weighted. So um, when we initialize a neural network, these weights are all set to the same thing, uh, but they can be adjusted uh, throughout the learning process. So if I set the weights here, uh, I have 0.5, 1, 2, and 4. So basically what I do is I'll multiply my entry by the weight and sum all of them into um, this portion here. And this is what I get here. So if I do a weighted sum of all of the entries, I get a total of 28. The second thing that's added uh, from the neuron that can be changed uh, by the learning process is the bias. So the bias here is two. So I would add two to my overall uh, 28 sum and get the result of 30. So from all of these entries, I get a result of 30. After that is uh, what we call the activation step. So the activation function of a neural net can be um, differently made. So there's different mathematical function that could be used. But basically, um, the value here that goes to the uh, to the function here, we'll look at a sigmoid activation function here. Um, so the value of 30 is put on the x-axis and using the sigmoid function, we can estimate the y, uh, the y uh, for that given x and that becomes our output. So in the case of sigmoid function, it would vary between minus one and one. Um, so that's one here. So that's how a neuron works. So if you were to just do one neuron, you could do that and you get a result at the end and that's it. So again, Pretty easy to do on a piece of paper. We can even do it in PowerPoint. Uh, where it gets a little bit more complex is when we use those neural net for uh, computer vision. So basically we're feeding in uh, an image, but you have to remember that an image is just a bunch of uh, numbers again. So each pixel of an image uh, has a value for a color. So most time we'll feed in RGB images. So you have an image has three channel, which is the red, green, and blue. And then you have a value for green, blue, and red for each pixel. And that's what makes um, the color image that you feed in. So the way the neural net works is that the first layer will do what we call a convolution. And that's what you see in that little animated GIF here. So it goes through the image with a moving window filter and would um, basically create a second image, an output here. So another layer from, um, the weighted um, sum and the activation function for each of these moving window passes. So that's how it sort of convolutes an image and that's called an encoder. So that's how uh, things are encoded. Um, so that's how it's seen here. So you have uh, the original input image, you have a filter and then you have uh, the final value on the output array. So that's when you're on being activated. And this is what, if you were to zoom into that process, this is what we get here. So that's how these uh, things work. And this is how they see basically. So when we talk about computer vision, it actually doesn't see, but it creates a bunch of activation map. Um, so if you look at these images here, you see that's uh, we've just mapped out or just produced the activation, one of the activation map from the different filters that are uh, being run over the, uh, the learning process, but you see what it does, it actually maps out the different shapes. So you see here you have, uh, that's a thermometer, I think. And then you see that this activation level into the neural net actually maps out the contour of the rounded object. Um, you have that painting here of a panda or a picture of a panda. And again, here we're mapping out that painting. 
and this is one for the church. So this is how the computers uh, actually see the image. And here you see it, it's been overlaid on top of the image, but basically, yes. Yeah. So one activation would map maybe the contour, maybe the other activation would map uh, the internal uh, components of that image. So if we were to process this image, and that's uh, taken from, uh, from uh, one of my colleagues here in Quebec City, uh, who had it in a presentation, I found it pretty funny because people think that deep learning and AI is soon, soon gonna be replacing everyone. And that's something I that said just before we actually started today. Uh, but there's a good reason why it won't ever do uh, be able to do our job. So if I run this image of uh, the president or the ex president of the United or the ex ex president of the United States, uh, sort of doing a prank to one of his colleagues. So his colleague is weighing himself here on the balance, uh, and then you see that he has his foot on uh, the balance. So he, he's he's thinking that he's Way, more, way heavier than he actually is. Everyone is laughing in the back and this is a joke. So as a human, we're able to see all the components of the image and sort of put it in context and understand the underlying uh, joke about the image. But if I ask a computer to look at this image, this is basically what I would get. So these are the different, or a few of the different activation functions, but you see one of the activation functions sort of map out to different people. Uh, this one maps out different colors and then so on. It sort of decompose the sort of build the decomposition of the image through the convolution to sort of understand what's going on, but it's not actually truly understanding what's going on. So when we have a neural net, what, what we need to do is we need to sort of build it and then we need to train it. So there's uh, one way we'll, we'll be training it is by using what we call uh, stochastic gradients. And basically the stochastic uh, gradient is a way that we can estimate um, the function that's gonna fit the data. Uh, by finding the lowest point in a 3D sort of surface here. So if you look at the, the, the right image here as that little sort of ball moves to the lower point, you have the error on the Z axis here and that's what we're trying to minimize. So we're trying to minimize the prediction error while we train the algorithm. And to do that, we can move either weights or biases. So you remember the weights and the biases on my uh, little schema of a neuron. So that's what I'm allowed to move. So basically I can vary those and then I can find which of uh, the combination of weight and biases would create the lowest error possible. And that would be one epoch of training. So we do that with a lot of data. We try to fit a function on the data by optimizing that stochastic uh, gradient. So the other thing we need to feed in and this is this year, um, you'll see that it looks a lot like a, uh, the objective function that you're trying to minimize when you do an inversion of geophysical data. But what we're working with in uh, deep learning is called a loss function. So the loss function is basically the parameter that estimates the error. And that's, uh, that error is trying to, to be minimized by the training process of the algorithm. So in the case here, I've got a GIF of uh, training a, um, of uh, an image and answer uh, neural net. Um, and you see that uh, the an the answer, uh, the portion of the generator here of my neural net is the, the blue curve. And you see, as the training evolves, you see that the value slowly decrease, slowly decrease. And at some point I'll hit a sill and that's where I would consider my uh, neural net being enough to train to be applied to data. So that's my loss function. So that's why I'm trying to minimize. In that case here, and I'll, I'll come back to that later, there's two loss functions that are being optimized at the same time and that's a different problem. Uh, but yeah, I'm always trying to optimize and narrow rate on my prediction. So how does that work basically is, We'll run the data through our neural nets. On a case here, I'm feeding a low resolution image. It's being decomposed through a series of convolution and rebuilt through uh, up convolutions here to make uh, my high resolution image. And then it's compared to the ground truth. And that comparison will give up the error. So as you see in the GIF here, the information is propagated along uh, the neural net and then you get an answer at the end. Then we compare the answer to the ground truth in the training process. And then uh, the step that happens here that you're seeing right now is called the back propagation. So we're back propagating the error through the neural net to adjust the weights and biases of each neuron in order to get a better prediction the next time around. So that's how these things are trained. So they have to be trained over a long time and lots of epochs using lots of data. If you don't train them using uh, enough data, you run into the problem of what, creating a, what we call overfitting model that are not generalized enough. So they'll be really, really good at uh, working for your particular data set, but they could never be applied outside of uh, the realm of data that you've been uh, providing your, your, uh, your learning. So you have to adjust that in order to make it 
a little bit better. So if we go back to our sort of schematic neuron here, I have a prediction it equals one, and I'll compare it to the actual uh, reality here, which is zero. So what we do here through back propagation, we can adjust the weights and biases. So I'll go and change my weights. I'll go and change the bias to see if I can get a result that, clo that is close to the reality. So you see here, my neuro, uh, my uh, network is really good. So it adjusted all of the bias, uh, the weights here. It's going to change the sum, obviously. I'm going to change the bias as well to one. And then instead of 30 here as an output, I get five. So if I get five on that activation function, I'll adjust it here. My X is equal to five. My prediction here is going to be closer to zero. I get a zero as an output and my network would be trained. So the error would be to the minimum it can be. In our case, it's zero, it's the same, uh, but that slowly decreases. It's rarely that you'll have it first go around. Uh, the cool thing about neural nets and deep learning is a notion called transfer learning. And in transfer learning, that means that you can train your model on a big data set. Again, trying to create as much of a general model as possible. And through just a little bit of retraining, you can apply it to new data really easily. So basically, you can use a lot of data to train your models. In a case here, we're training an image classifier. So it does all of the feature learning, prediction, and gets a predictor for car, bicycle, or any type of vehicle in our case here. And then uh, transfer learning, what, what that does is once the network is sufficiently trained, you can just feed it new data to the pre-trained model, ask it a new task, and normally it should be able to produce your new task. So that's what uh, transfer learning is. So in short, uh, convolution neural networks are just a series of simple mathematic calculation function. Uh, the aim is to mimic the way a bi biological neuron would work. Uh, the activation path and the activated neurons in the network uh, combined with weights and biases uh, are what makes the predict the prediction at the end. So it's not a prediction pulled out of thin air. It's not a black box. We can follow the data around. Um, they're designed to uh, work for um, image interpretation by decomposing the observers, observable features in an image into input uh, attention maps. And that's something we'll focus on later on today. The learning process is similar to a basic trial and error process. So the first few go around at training your network is going to perform poorly but it learns from its mistakes and sort of adjusts itself until it makes the right prediction. So that's sort of a trial and error and that's how the human brain actually works. Um, and we're pretty far from the sentient network uh, or from deep learning replacing the brain of a geologist. So in my view, the goal of um, the deep learning and applying deep learning to uh, the geology world would be um, just to help uh, decision makers, uh, geologists, geophysicists make better decisions, but also sort of be able to pre-process all of the data into something that's easily readable or sort of easily uh, interpretable as well. So yeah, so what we'll do now then is we'll move on to examples of uh, how to successfully apply uh, neural networks to geo geophysical uh, data processing and geological interpretation. So in uh, this little section of the talk, I'll just be giving uh, out a few examples of how I've been using deep learning to uh, generate either new products, um, to filter data, or just to uh, generate prelim new geological maps. Uh, so one thing that's been used uh, that, that we were using and trying to sort of uh, get more uptake on is uh, just the use of uh, image vision model. So when AlexNet came out in 2012, uh, it was sort of one of the first instance of uh, image vision um, algorithm. So image vision basically uh, was it's a contest that happens every year. So the goal is to classify a huge data set. I think it's uh, 400,000 images into different categories. So they have a bunch of labels and basically have to predict what is in each image as accurate with the most accuracy as possible. One of the best performer out there uh, throughout the years was uh, VGG19 which stands for Visual Geometry Group. Um, so that Neural net performs really well at seeing different uh, objects into images and classify them into the right uh, bins, basically. So the way it works, as I said, is just it identifies edges, textures, features, distinctive features. I think one of the key ones you would see here is sort of the cat image on the top here. So you see that it's able to map out the two eyes and sort of triangular shape of the cat's nose towards its mouth and uh, nose. 
So that's sort of a, could be a distinctive feature of cats. And that's what, how it's able to say, well, that's a cat on the, uh, on the picture. So that model is uh, available online. It's free. You can use it to uh, classify different images. But what's most, most interesting to me is not the final prediction, because obviously we're not <laughs> trying to find cats and dogs and images in geology. We're trying to sort of filter the data to see new things, new uh, lineaments maybe, or new uh, sort of insight uh, to different uh, images. So images that we'll be processing in our case are mostly geophysical surveys or spectral imagery or even just Landsat uh, LIDAR data. So well, I've tested the uh, VGG19 model. It's pretty easy. It's just, I think it's 20 lines of codes in Python and I can spit out uh, the input image, the feature maps for the different levels of the network here and the prediction at the end. So in that case here, I fed in the dog image and it says it's a Samoyed it's mostly sure it's either a Samoyed or a Pomeranian dog. Um, I'm not sure of the actual breed of the dog. I don't know if there was any dogs that's expert in the in the room today, but yeah, I think it it makes a good point at, at being able to predict that it's somewhat of a dog. You see Arctic fox, yeah, it's white, it's furry, it looks like an Arctic fox. A white wolf would actually make sense too, or an Angora, which is a, just a hairy cat. So yeah, that works pretty well. So I've tried it with other image, uh, images. So in case here, that's I think you could uh, recognize that from the Geolog uh, website. So I took that image and ran it through the uh, VGG19. And it says it's a volcano mostly, or a stingray, or an electric ray. So you see that it basically picked out the rounded shape. Uh, I like the fact that it sees that it's a volcano. It's not quite a volcano, but it's, <laughs> it's something associable to, associable to a volcano. And then I went through the different talks uh, and sort of got some uh, screen grabs on different talks. So that's uh, one of the last talks that happened from uh, Lucy uh, here. And uh, it has more trouble with this one. So you see the attention maps are really interesting. So you see it's able to pick out all of the different features of the image if you look on all of the attention maps, but it, it performs really poorly at classifying what, what we're seeing on, a, on the screen. The reason being there's a lot of things going on in the screen. And um, it's not something that's been trained to classify. So basically it's not part of the label. So you see it's either a book jacket, a website, which would make sense. It looks somewhat like a layout from a website, an envelope, which is this one I don't really get, a maze. Yeah, maybe, maybe the pyramid could be somewhat of a maze there or just a resource. The resource geology job is sometimes pretty uh, similar to a maze. So maybe that's what it's picking up. Uh, and then I fed in another one from the high size talk as well. I was trying to see if the, uh, it would recognize the truck and it did pretty poorly. So it's either a solar dish, an electrical fan, an envelope, a binder or a binder or a sundial. So, I mean, yeah, maybe a solar dish from all of those lines. But again, you see that it's the VGG19 model is not really good at making the prediction for our type of imagery or complex imagery. It's mostly build to sort of find dogs and cats into images, but it works really well at finding different features in the images. So you see that it finds out textures, uh, different edges, sometimes nothing, sometimes other things, color schemes and all of that. So that's something that's quite interesting. So in my mind, um, I think that's something we could uh, try. So one last thing I tried is just launch it on a geophysical survey. So that's a mag survey that uh, was taken up uh, in Northern Quebec. And then again, yeah, it doesn't, it has no clue what it is. Basically, it's either a prayer rug, an anchor chief, or an envelope velvet quilt. So yeah, it does look like a somewhat of a rug. Yeah, it could be a funky pattern for a rug. Uh, but what really struck me is what came out of those activation maps, right? So you see in that case here, it sort of picks out different lineaments. So it looks almost like a first vertical derivative here. But you do see other things that are either sort of horizontal derivative. We're picking out sort of uh, domains here in the mag some round features maybe here, some more vertical things. So I think that's where it becomes really interesting. So what uh, my idea was is, well, could we just apply it to, um, to geophysical data set in terms of a geophysical filter? So that's a novelty filter that would be able to extract information out of data. So in a case here, I fed it a uh, geophysical data set or uh, grid. Um, and then I extracted the first um, activation or the first layer activation maps here. So that's about, uh, that's not about, it's exactly 64 different images that are produced here. And uh, I've taken the dominant uh, feature extraction uh, pattern and sort of displayed it on a grid. 
So you see that what comes out of it is mostly those linear features, you see the mag highs being sort of highlighted, but you do see some textural component also coming out of the uh, feature engineering here. That's quite interesting if you were to try to generate a um, uh, sort of preliminary map from your geophysical data. So yeah, you're finding your highs, but you're also trying to decipher between different textures in the domains of the magnetic data. So that's something of interest. Um, these are the features, uh, the feature maps. So that's 128 features are creating through the second level of that convolution net. And this is what we get. So again, we're getting more distinct uh, sort of different lineaments. Uh, we're getting edges. These edges are mostly sort of horizontal or sort of east to west in the case here. But again, we're sort of deciphering different uh, things and so seeing through uh, most of the data, especially in these areas here that are sort of pretty model if you look at the signature from just the, uh, the geophysical, uh, the magnetic um, RTP here. But if you look at what's taken out of the feature map, you do see some resolution being sort of uh, introduced into the mag. And as we go down into the convolution, that's the 260 or 56 feature map here, we're extracting bigger feature because we're sort of uh, decreasing the size of the image. So basically what we're extracting, extracting our bigger features. So again, here, this is what we're seeing on that, that grid. So the way we could use those, and these take about, I would say one second to apply to rather big grids. So that's something that could be, so you pre, the model is preloaded. So it, it's already trained. You don't need to train it. You just basically need to apply it to your data set. And then you can overlay it onto your mag uh, data. So that's the mag data with the, the first feature map, the first dominant feature map being overlain on it. Uh, that's the mag with the second uh, level of the feature maps being overlain on it. And that's the last level. So you see that we're sort of, mapping different features at different scales uh, throughout the different levels of our convolution net. And that could help into the data interpretation. So we do see sort of edges come out really well. So that could be used by a geologist to sort of uh, create uh, interpretation lineament maps or structural maps. Uh, one interesting thing here is that we see there is sort of a lineament that's being mapped out here really well that we didn't really see in the original data. So that's something of interest, right? So that's how we could use uh, just a plain sort of pre-trained model that's used normally for computer vision and identifying CAT into making new filters for the uh, interpretational uh, work of geophysical data. Um, the thing I'm gonna talk now is um, something out of the movie. So if you've all seen the spy movies where they, there's a license plate image of some car. Uh, they have a satellite image. And then there's some guy in a room standing up saying, well, zoom in into that plate. And then they zoom in, it's all blurry. And then they say, enhance the image. And then some guy types a bunch of lines, hits enter, and then the image becomes clear. So that used to be somewhat futuristic, somewhat impossible, uh, but it's actually getting more and more possible. And that's something that's really interesting for us. And I'll, I'll explain to you why. Um, so that these are, uh, these type of work are done through what we call GANs. GANs are generative adversarial networks. Uh, it's a class of machine learning framework uh, that was designed in 2014. And in that case, we're not actually using uh, one neural net. We're battling two different neural nets at the same time. So we have what's called a generator. So the generator here is trying to construct an image, either from random noise or from a pre-existing image. And then it creates an image. And then it Go, that created that image that's been created by the generator is, go, is going through a second neural net. And that second neural net is called a discriminator. And basically what, what happens here is that the generator is trying to make an image. The discriminator is trying to say if that image is fake or real. So the way the discriminator is trained is by feeding in real data and fake data. And the generator actually takes um, existing data and produce a new image. And it tries to fool, fool the discriminator into thinking that whatever image it produced is a real image. So uh, these uh, made encoder decoder networks that, that were around for a long time really more performant just because they're producing results that are almost impossible to decipher between fake and real. And anything you've heard of deep fakes, it's all due to the advances in GAN technology. So uh, one cool GIF here that I found on the NVIDIA uh, website um, today is something that we're, they're actually actively working on right now is uh, sort of a crude paint uh, interface that could produce new images. So you see here that you basically do an image mask. So you tell the, uh, the, you tell the, uh, the network, you say, well, I want sand here. 
I want to have C there, a mountain here, the sky is going to be there, maybe some clouds, or maybe I'll change the sand for rocks. And you see that these are completely fake images that are being generated by the network. So none of these things actually exist. They're just uh, generated by the GAN network. And yeah, it's cool to just look at it right now. Um, most people wouldn't see an application to it, but there's actually a lot of things that could be <laughs> brought into the world. If you think about uh, computer game creation, sort of endless world generation uh, into endless sort of infinite computer uh, world, that would be one way where you're actually decreasing the size of your game because your game is solely just a bunch of image masks or that could be generated automatically or randomly. And then the real world image, uh, the environment of your computer game is generated through the GAN approach. So through the pre-trained model. The other thing you could think of any sort of uh, CGI movies, uh, that would be an easier way to do it. And one thing that's actually being used and sort of built on right now is what we're doing right now. So if you're doing, and we all have been doing a lot of conferences call over webcams uh, lately, at least for the past two years. And uh, the big thing is bandwidth, right? So we're sending high quality images that are getting across the world. Uh, they have to be sort of same quality when they get at the other end. And that's pretty uh, expensive in terms of bandwidth. So if you were able to decompose the actual feed uh, from the webcam into something that's a little bit less uh, quality, so, so decrease, basically compress the video into something that's uh, way smaller, and then sort of regenerate the actual image at the other end using a GAN, uh, you're saving a lot into the bandwidth that you actually need for those conference calls. So that's something that's been actually actively worked on by different uh, call providers, but also by NVIDIA. So that's one of the applications. So in our case here, uh, what I'll be showing is uh, stems from the ASR GAN, which stands from for the Enhanced Super Resolution GAN. And that's something that was created as, again, a lot of uh, these things are created as part of a open source contest and sort of generate publication. Uh, in the case here, we're trying to take a low resolution image patch of a high resolution image. So if we look at that baboon face here, you see that it has a little mustache hair. And then um, what they're trying to do is basically uh, get the low resolution input of that and upscale it to a higher resolution using a neural net. So you see that's the high resolution, uh, the true high resolution. It's always compared to the bicubic uh, interpolation process, the sort of a shitty process. But yeah, you see that the low resolution is pretty low res. And then these are the different networks that were used over time to sort of increase the resolution. And you see that the SR GAN here is the one that produces the best results. So basically from an image that looks like that, through training on the rest of the data set, it can increase the resolution of that little patch to something that's close to the reality. So you see all of those little details, they're pretty well uh, made. So that got me thinking, and one of the issues we faced in geology is that we'll sometimes have uh, magnetic data over large regions that are low resolution. So if I take the example of Quebec, we have the whole country, or even Canada, almost all of the countries covered by a 200 meter line uh, mag survey. Uh, but then you have some areas with higher resolution mag survey down to almost 50 meters in some areas. Uh, but sometimes in your property, you have a high resolution patch of survey and then you're missing a little bit, a little patch of a high resolution elsewhere on your property, just because it's an older survey or which wasn't flown for a different reason. So my goal was to see if we could uh, train a GAN into uh, building or sort of enhancing the mag uh, surveys from existing mag surveys to an area where you only have low resolution. So what we're doing uh, in the case here is we're training a generalized model to sort of a provincial scale in our case. So I'm using all of the superior province mag of uh, Quebec. So in that case, we have a good uh, fit between low res uh, mag from an Arcan and the high resolution mag from the Quebec government. And then what I'm doing is zooming into my area of interest. So maybe at the property scale, I'm resampling another mag uh, between low and high resolution to sort of overfit my training model. And then I can apply it on to my little patch of uh, area that doesn't have magnetic or high resolution magnetic data. So that's how it's been uh, sort of trained. So on the left here, you have the high resolution, or sorry, I inverted those two titles. It should be the other around. That's the low resolution image. That's the high resolution image. So I've taken and tiled uh, this general training area um, to create my generalized model. Then I overfit my model. So sort of retrain it here on an area that's closer to my uh, validation data that's uh, sitting just east of there. 
So in the case of a property, maybe you would have a high resolution mag here, but that little patch here would have only low resolution mag. And then you're trying to build, let's say a structural model, a structural interpretation. So you would benefit by having higher resolution data in order to sort of not bias your line work too much when you do that linear interpretation. So what we do is we'll feed in the, uh, the patch of uh, sort of general model. So we know the actual answer. So we feed in the low resolution image we create a high resolution uh, image out of the generator and then we compare it against the reality because we do have that, uh, that area with high, uh, high resolution data and we're optimizing the generator here. So the error on the generator here is basically the difference between uh, the true image and the fake one, which is the one produced by the generator. And here uh, the orange line is the loss function for the discriminator. So the discriminator has to be better and better at this, uh, deciphering between fake and real images as the training increases to be able to produce higher quality um, fake images. We'll call them fake, but we can call them uh, enhanced. So that's the process here. So then we do a second round of training here, another 2000 epochs. So as I said, the, these things need a lot of time. So this model took it about three days to train. So it uses, originally it uses about uh, three to, uh, 300 images on the regional survey another 200 images on the overtraining uh, model, and then it ran for an overhaul of uh, 4,000 epochs with about 2, 000, uh, 200 images each epoch. So it takes a long time and a lot of data and some computing power. So in the end, what we get is uh, you have, that's the validation data set. So in the validation data set, what we're doing is we're just applying the model. The model has never seen the high resolution uh, image of that area. So that's the low res image here on the left. That image would be the real image. Um, you see, we've calculated the error between the, high, the real and, the, and itself. So obviously the, the error is zero, is zero here. Um, but you see, um, this is the sort of the benchmark. Um, and again, I have to stress that the model has never seen that image into its uh, training. This is the enhanced image that we can get. So you see from this uh, type of data, this is what we're able to produce. So we're almost, or at least we're trying to, re re getting there at replicating the different features of serving this mag into a higher resolution mag that's how, that was never actually seen by the algorithm. The image, is, uh, the image error is kind of low. Uh, the SME score is also uh, pretty low, so that's really good. And that's sort of the standard way of doing it is normally you would do a downward continuation filter on the image to try and increase the level of noise as is if you were closer to the ground, but uh, you see that it's way, the DSR GAN performs way better at increasing the image resolution that the standard uh, the downward continu continuation filter that's been used by the industry mostly. So that's something that's really interesting. So basically you could enhance uh, some, some parts of your mag surveys if you were missing. Uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about is image segmentation for geological mapping. And that's a really good approach. Again, that's been used and sort of uh, adopted really well into the medical imagery world. In that case, we're using what's called a WNET. And the goal is to take input images, so a bunch of channel of data. We'll decompose them, recompose them into a mask. So that's the map. And then from there, we'll take the map, decompose it, recompose it into the original signal. So it's a bit like if you were to do a, a geophysical inversion where you invert the data and then produce a Ford model to test it. So that's the goal and that's how the W network uh, network works. Uh, so you have the image here and it tries to generate a uh, map of, in that case here, that's a slice to uh, thorax and it's trying to map out, I think the liver here. And then you see that the image networks really well at uh, finding that liver area with a lot of, uh, of accuracy. So we're applying that to geological data. So basically, if we have a bunch of geophysical surveys, uh, that works better with things that are measuring, well, it depends what you're trying to do. But if you're trying to generate a geological map, you have to keep in mind that you need some data that are reflecting of the actual underlying rock. So if you have no cover, that's the best place because you could use radiometric, aster, and maybe mag. Uh, if you include gravity, sometimes you'll see things that are not seen at surface, but could uh, also help you in sort of generating a better comprehension of the geology. But basically, the goal is to feed in geophysical data set or remote sensing data set. It goes to the first generator here, the first network, generates a segmented images or image uh, with different segments that are closer to pseudo lithologies. And then from those pseudo lithologies, it's going to try to recreate the starting data. And then the discriminator is going to work at trying to 
see how well we're doing at uh, regenerating the input images from uh, the mask. So uh, what I did here is I went and uh, actually my colleague James uh, and Jem uh, in Australia gave me a data set from Tasmania. That's the Balfour region of Tasmania. So if we zoom into the here, I had a, a grid here. So that's the area that, I, that my data covered. So in that data set, I had the digital elevation model. I had the magnetic data uh, with some derivatives and the gravity data um, that was uh, gridded and the radiometric. So what I did first is I ran all of these uh, channels uh, of my images into a, just a correlation matrix. So here, what we're trying to do is remove things that are strongly correlated. The reason being that if you leave in two channels that are too strongly correlated, you're actually putting, uh, you're, you're sort of double weighing that data type into uh, the final mask. So uh, you're trying to remove those sort of self-correlated features. So in the end, I'm left with seven input channels. So you have potassium, the TMR TP, uh, the boogie, you have the first vertical derivative of the mag, you have thorium, uranium, and the digital elevation model. Then from there, what I did is I tiled uh, the, these surveys into smaller tiles here and through image augmentation by either rotating them, flipping the images, or stretching them in different ways. I created 60 learning images for my uh, for my network. So I'll be training my network using those 60 images, and then I'll apply it to uh, the full grid afterwards. So this is a training process of my uh, of my double unit for segmentation. So you see that's my input data, my seven channels, and then these are the uh, little squares are the training images that are used to train my model. And on the right here, you see how the segmentation evolves through uh, training. So it starts really noisy, but with time, and then I haven't include the, included the full training, but with time, you'll see that it starts to clean out some of these uh, segments into things that are more uh, spatially correlated and sort of generate areas that are more similar. So in the end, what you're left with is a predictor map. So in a case here, I ran um, the process for 10 different classes. So these are the probability of finding uh, one of the 10 classes on that grid. So I can map that back into a uh, segmented image. And this is what I get in the end. So that's my segmentation of that survey or that uh, multi-channel data. And that's the original uh, geological map. So yes, it's not exactly corresponding to the geological map. And that's the goal here. So the goal is not to reproduce a geological map uh, because there's no point of doing that. If you're trying to reproduce something that was done before, you're actually not finding new things. The goal is to see the data with new eyes and sort of potentially see new features in the data. So one thing we see is that fault here that sort of runs uh, north, northwest. Uh, we see it in data. It's been mapped out uh, by the segments kind of well. So you see that long lineament here probably corresponds to that. Uh, you see there are some volcanics here in a uh, different rock package. They're also being mapped out by the segmentation image. And then something interesting is uh, what we'll see in the next picture. Here, that's the Balfour um, town, and with there's uh, some exploration going around there. Uh, but what you see here is just underneath uh, the area that's currently explored for sort of intrusive related uh, deposit, you see that there is a segment that sort of came out um, of a rounded shape uh, that could possibly sort of be related to an underlying intrusion. So that's uh, things that you can get out of the segmentation process of images. So again, let me stress out the fact that we're not trying to reproduce the original geological map because there would be sort of little uh, information gained into that. But what we're really trying to do is see how, how are the different signatures correlated between them and what they would produce in terms of uh, pseudolithologies. And then we can use that as an exploration tool or maybe as an input for um, uh, exploration vectoring as well. So um, that's that. And then I'm coming to the conclusion. So yeah, I mean, I think the use of deep learning uh, is expected to increase in the field of geosciences. I guess that's my goal. And that's the goal of the talk is sort of get a little bit more uptake from the industry, sort of uh, try to uh, filter out some of the people that are not the people, but the thinking uh, that it's a black box that we don't understand it, that it shouldn't be applied. I think there's uh, things that are that should be more common. So geophysical filters, data enhancement, encoder decoder for interpretation and segmentation of images is, is early things that could be done using deep learning that would benefit the geologists by sort of merging a lot of information into uh, something that's a little bit more simply interpreted. 
And, and contrary to the popular belief, deep learning is not a black box. I hope I made my point across today. You sort of saw how the math works. It's simple, it's explainable. Um, the reason why we don't actually uh, do it sort of uh, in sort of broader scale explanation is just because these networks are so large that it would be impossible to sort of express each neuron in individually. The process is simple. The training process is simple. The way it learns is pretty simplistic as well. It's through trial and error of adjusting weights and biases, uh, but it requires a lot of computing power and training examples. So these training examples, they could be uh, done by either image augmentation like we saw earlier, or they could uh, also be made using synthetic model. And that's something we're actually working right now is how we could use synthetic model in known areas to generate more training examples to general to create more generalized uh, pre-trained model that could be overtrained on your particular areas of interest. So that's something that's actually being worked on right now. And then I'll leave you for, uh, with a little uh, thing for the future. So I think one of the next thing, and that's something I'm currently working on, and that should be sort of uh, slowly being uptaken. So as we talk about undercover exploration, what I've been uh, working on is using uh, what's called vector field modeling into modeling undercover uh, dispersal uh, traces for different uh, different settings. So in our case, uh, in Quebec, we have a lot of glacier till on top of our uh, mineralization and bedrock. Uh, so these uh, glacier produced uh, dispersion trains of different elements, different uh, minerals. And then we do a lot of sort of overburden drilling to try to find those dispersal trains. Uh, and I came up with a way to generate vectors or linear or liniments or call them whatever you want. But the lines you see here is basically how uh, an automated model of the dispersal train trails would be looking for a given element. So that's something that's been worked on right now. And that's another application of deep learning to um, geosciences. Everything you've seen today is actually done uh, in Python using open source libraries. There's nothing that's proprietary besides the fact that I've taken something that's used in one realm of the sciences and applied it to another one. Uh, it's all done through, uh, as I said, Python and the GOH5Pi uh, feature, which is a open source connection between the GOH5 uh, geoscience analyst uh, software package. So basically you're uh, you have a Python library that's able to read different elements into your ge uh, geoscience analyst project. So any elements could be grids, 2D grids, 3D grids, objects, uh, wells, points, whatever. You can bring them in Python, do whatever you want with them, and then spin them back into analysts really quickly. So that's one quick way of testing your model and seeing the results of your model without having to go through third-party CSVs, exporting, importing, and all of that thing. Uh, once the models are pre-trained, it's even quicker. You can have a pre-trained model, just apply it to your data and see the results right away into geoscience analysts. So that's how everything that I've shown you today was uh, built. And that's it. Well, yes, this, is, this has been so wonderful. So thank you so, so much. I know it's probably getting later and later over there. So I'm so appreciative of you chatting to us. It's um, yeah, been really, really interesting. And yeah, there's so many great comments. Everyone's really, really loved hearing from you. Yeah. <sighs>